or one MPP, how she stands up and fights in provincial parliament at Queen's Park. She is amazing. She is amazing. Now, I didn't clear this with either her or Jim, the party leader, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you know, as far as I believe her spirit animal is a mongoose. You know mongoose is cute little things, but they kill king cobras and black mambas. They kill any snake. They're little, they look cute, but they're deadly. Thank you. Thank you everyone for your uh, opening uh, statements. I'd also like to uh, do a shout out to uh, the Weston uh, Baptist uh, Church for uh, the beautiful uh, facilities uh, tonight. Thank you very much, John, for uh, our <laughs> appreciate everybody uh, wearing their mask. Um, we are live streaming. We've got film and also uh, recording just to make sure, just to be aware of that. We're up to uh, 80 people in here right now. I'm still comfortable with this number and we've got some uh, chairs uh, spread out and we'll, and we'll have ushers try to get them to those uh, empty chairs. And so what I'm going to do is I've got some uh, questions here already and then and then do you have a question after that? Take it. Great. So uh, we'll start off the one that's in my hand here. It's it's from uh, Sherry Hurst, and it's to uh, all candidates. And uh, we'll start with uh, Tom, and we'll work our way uh, to me. And then uh, again, you've got uh, um, 90 seconds for each. What would you do to protect the environment and build heritage from massive development in the future? We definitely have a contrarian view um, as far as um, some of the environmental stuff in, in this way. So for instance, um, we believe that starting with the Liberals and now the Conservatives have gone and continued the, uh, the debacle with, uh, with our energy and our hydro, uh, right, making our, our hydro rates skyrocket with, with all the windmills. Um, we actually propose to get rid of those windmills. Um, one of the things that uh, people will say about that is, oh, how can you do it? The contracts are already done. It's, 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 uh, it's impossible. And what we say is, well, you know what? Look at what the three parties did over the last couple of years and all the businesses they shut down, all the small businesses. So we should shut down windmills that are costing us, that, that basically made our electricity market the most expensive, I believe, behind California in North America, um, overdoing this. And a lot of times it's backroom deals, people making a lot of money, but it's absolutely ridiculous. And then what you do is you actually concentrate. So for instance, a lot of times when people are talking about carbon, for instance, right? Well, at the same time we're talking about carbon, and this is more of a federal issue, but we're dumping raw sewage into the St. Lawrence River, but then we're talking about carbon. So we would actually reduce, we go, uh, we get rid of the carbon tax our, ourselves in Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sean, to the question. Heritage is, is in the heart of our community, as you know, in the Western, we have so many heritage um, um, facilities and, 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 and houses and areas that we need to protect and preserve. And we need also to make sure that the environment is number one issue for us, because uh, the environment is, is really important to us, and we've seen the crisis of the environment. What we are proposing the Ontario NDP is first uh, to reach the uh, net zero emissions for all new buildings. By 2030, plus a retrofit program that will also benefit, make or create jobs for the future and jobs for for, uh, for the green economy. Also to clean cleaning water for every Ontarian. You know, we know that a lot of um, um, indigenous communities don't even have a clean water. We need also to make sure that also we are committed to uh, a just transition and to ensure no communities are left behind. Also, we need to protect the green, uh, uh, green land. To do that, we need to also cancel uh, the, um, the highway 413 uh, bypass to 
make sure also we use those money, uh, wasted money, into uh, important, into important priorities in our communities. Also, we are planning to plant one billion trees by the year 2030 to improve also re recycling and targets are working with these technologies and also producers. Thank you. Um, a question that involves the environment and heritage speaks to my heart as a teacher of geography and environmental studies and history for the past 20 years. Um, let's start with this community. I've been going around and speaking to a lot of people in this community. I've been at community meetings and I'm aware of the needs of protecting our heritage green space in this community. Whether we're talking about Smythe Park, Pier and Park, the Eglinton Flats, the Humber River, and so on. But we also need infrastructure development projects, and those are happening here. So how do we do it? Ontario Liberals plan to do it by ensuring that we scrap municipal zoning orders, which the Ford government has used ad nauseum to override the, the, the you know, values and um, you know, things that we hold dear in our community. Uh, so we'll get rid of those. We will require meaningful consultation and transparent consultation subject to judi judicial review by um, by the um, Metrolinx, and also we will do things like scrap the 413 highway, which paves right through our green belt, expand that green belt, which as you know as, is a watershed that drains right into uh, Black Creek and Humber River, and we will plant more trees, build more provincial parks, and so on and so forth. But it has to come from our community, and that's why I want to be your voice at Queen's Park. These two topics in themselves are very broad. Uh, the first thing I will address is the heritage issue and development. I would consult with the community and understand what is unique and the properties that make that structure a heritage builder, building and work with current developers to incorporate that into their developments. The third thing, or the other thing I would work with uh, developers with is just with regards to trees, and not cutting down pre-existing trees. And I would say that most governments, when they talk about planting trees, they're talking monoculture, and they forget about the microbes and other living organisms that make up a healthy ecosystem. And I think we need to address that as a government when we talk about things. But the first starting point is just not cutting down pre-existing healthy trees. Furthermore, to the environment, I would suggest that we put on uh, overpass at Black Creek and Lawrence. It would do a couple of different things. Number one, it would create safety for the community, but more importantly, it would stop idle traffic all afternoon, all the way to the 401 that continues to pollute, it continues to waste time for the community. It needs to be done. Thank you. Go ahead. Is Eric here? Would you like to read his question? Eric? Oh, okay. Then who's after Eric? Then we have Bob. Do you want to read yours? And then Bob, you're just up next, on deck, okay. So we'll, we'll start with Eric, though. So the, the order we'll go with uh, for the next question is as Nadia, then Tom, James, and then Faisal. This is from Eric. Almost one in five Toronto households have issues with flood security. Food. Food, sorry, food security. According to the latest CPI from StatsCan, food has increased by almost 9% this year, last year. How would you fix this problem? We're gonna start with Um, thanks for the question, Eric. Uh, when we, you know, as I go through this community and speak to people, I understand that food security is a huge issue, uh, and that one of the greatest um, 
issues I'm hearing about from everybody, no matter where we are in the community, is that life is not affordable. People have to choose between paying their rent and buying groceries, and that's just not dignified. So uh, what the Ontario Liberal Plan is, is to actually ensure that we can make life a little bit more affordable by doing things like bringing in rent control, uh, which this government has neglected to do. Uh, in addition to that, make life more affordable by cutting the grocery bill, by dropping 8% off the HST on prepared foods. Um, in addition to things like ensuring that people have a living wage uh, that is regionally aggregated because a $16 an hour minimum might work in somewhere like North Bay, but it won't necessarily get you far enough here in Toronto. In addition to that, we have to consider things like ensuring we have a green belt where a lot of our farming is done. Uh, and supporting uh, farming and so on in communities uh, that are urban as well as rural. So we have to approach the idea of affordability in a way that's innovative, and Ontario Liberals will do that in a way that isn't being done by the current government uh, and you know isn't part of the NDP plan. Thank you. Okay, so as far as food security, um, I believe the best way you'd be able to have food security is if you have more money in your pocket. So what we propose to do is we would not just cut the HST on, on you know, going out for a burger and it being under 20 bucks. We'd actually cut the H HST from 13% down to 10%. We'd also get rid of the carbon tax in Ontario. That's, um, so gas would go down, your HST goes down, as well, as Afra mentioned before, think about what your hydro rates were before McGinty and crew got in, and what happened to our hydro rates, and then what Ford and his cronies promised us with hydro rates, and what's actually going on now. So all that money, then you have that extra money in your pocket, guess what? You're not gonna be uh, a potential of starving, okay? And then another thing that I thought of is what about food security for those people that decided not to be forced to take a medical choice, a medical in intervention for the first time in Canadian history, being forced to take it? What about their food security? What about their ability to feed their families? Thank you. Thank you, Eric, uh, for the question. And uh, it's a shame that many members of our community are relying on food banks. And uh, this has worked for too long, and we need to do something about it. And one of the ways we can do that is, first and foremost, to deal with the issues of affordability and cost of living. And that is also increasing the minimum wage to $20 by 2020, 2026. And we'll restore also a real rent control and ban reductions, which also affect uh, the, the cost of living and, uh, and the quality of life of people. We will also regulate gas prices. As you see that uh, the Conservatives and the Liberals are on the same page on this file by saying that they're going to lower uh, the tax. But that will pass on to drivers and, and also to consumers. And that's why we need to regulate gas prices on that. And also uh, reduce our insurance, which is also part of the affordability issues in that, by reducing quickly 40% and ban increases for 18 months. And also expand also dental care, mental health services, and also from care. That will also ease on household budgets as well. We'll also work to lower hydro rates by restoring public ownership and connect to Manitoba and Quebec for cheaper and power imports. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, food security. The first thing that I'd like to point out is the Liberals' plan is to reduce prepared food, not your grocery bill. So they are planning on reducing the taxes on Burger King and McDonald's, not actual food. I would reduce the taxes on domestically produced vegetables and food at the grocery store. We have a vast agricultural section, sec section of Ontario that is more than capable of providing for our own citizens. Furthermore, 25% of all dairy products are subsidized by the government. 
this subsidization needs to allow for dairy products to be more affordable. And that is something that we must consult with the dairy industry to understand why the inflation in dairy products and regular produced Canadian vegetables, beef, and other edibles are so high right now. Thank you. So I just want to say that it's, uh, when we say uh, HST on prepared foods, um, there is HST on the rest of the groceries right now. So that's why it's being re 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 removed on prepared foods. Um, so that's just to clarify on that. Uh, and that beyond, goes beyond a burger because of course there's all kinds of hot tables and things that people buy. So just a point of order. Thank you. Thank you for that. And we're all here for information. And so, Gentlemen, you have uh, the next question. Do you want to stand up or do you want the microphone? Uh, I'll stand up. Thank you everyone for allowing me to speak. My name is Paul. I'm a community outreach worker and I'm an Ontario Disability recipient. I'm the chair of Acorn uh, York Southwestern. We're talking about affordability. My question is to all the panel here. 479 for shelter, where would we live? 672 for basic needs, 1169 a month. Where could you even rent 1169 a month? 1169 a month, 14,040 dollars a year. The threshold of poverty uh, uh, in the GTA is 19,930 dollars. When we talk about affordability, affordable for whom? When is everybody going to stand up and allow us to be counted, to stop the inhumane treatment of Ontario disability recipients? And my question is to the, all the panel, what are you going to do, what kind of action, not talk, what kind of action are you going to take to increase the lives of Ontario disability recipients that are suffering? They are suffering. Thank you.
types of issues are two reasons. Number one, Airbnb short-term rentals. So even if the government does create new possible rentals, if it is privatized, these rentals may and very well probably will go to short-term rentals. It's more economically viable for those owners. The second issue is I would make a minimum um, permanent residence statute that is three years, thereby stopping the flipping of housing. Now going back to the disability, I also think that we should bolster or boost the availability to counseling and mental health services for those that suffer of any kind of disability and the community at large. Thank you. I, I feel for you. I, I feel for you. I honestly think it, it, the answer as far as when we talked last time about food security ties in with this completely ties in. So things are just getting way too expensive for everyone. And in your case, it's just amplified with, with, with the disability. Um, so just in general, and what, what I'm gonna do instead of, you know, so as far as this part on our platform, I'd have to go back and, and actually go in and I would talk to Jim and Belinda, the leaders of the party, and I'd come back to you with specifics. So I'm not gonna lie to you and make something up. So on specifics, but just in general affordability. So imagine we do cut the HST from 13 to 10%. Imagine gas prices go down when we get rid of the carbon tax in Ontario. And imagine your hydro rates go down as well. It will certainly help. And then, like I said, as far as specifics uh, with, with people with disabilities and everything, uh, afterwards, feel free. I'll give you my contact and I will go. So. Um, in, in my work as a student advisor at a post-secondary institution, a lot of times students come up to me. I generally know everything that's going on in the college, but if I don't know anything, I don't lie to them. I say, look, let me go back, find out the answer for you, and I'll let you know. So I would do that. So if you want to see me afterwards, I'll, I'll give that to you, and I'll give you the exact stance from our party. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bob, for the question. I know it's, in, it's increasingly difficult, and especially with people who are living on Ontario disability um, a pension. So let's step back for a minute, because I think raising the ODSP rates is just the beginning of the conversation. And so Ontario Liberals have committed to raise that by 20%. And, but we have to look further than that. In addition to that is the overall approach to affordability. So how can we make life more affordable writ large? That one dollar is a big deal. That if we're dropping it from three dollars and twenty-five cents uh, to one dollar, that's saving people two dollars and twenty-five cents per ride every day. That's going to help with affordability. I was one of the first candidates to sign on with you and endorse universal basic income, um, and I actually spoke at uh, UBI now uh, conference over at uh, not a conference rather uh, March at Queens Park. And so bringing in things like universal basic income, bringing, reinstating that pilot so we can learn from the actual uh, studies and how it's affecting people's lives, in addition to raising the ODSP, bringing in $1 transit, raising the uh, old age pensions for the most needy seniors by $1,000 a year, and as well as the grocery bills and so on, it's an entire suite to an approach to affordability that's going to bring dignity to people like you and everyone else in our community. Know that I'm listening and I'm going to continue to champion for people like you. And it will be my pleasure to listen and learn and grow and push for more. Thank you. I have a question here from uh, Tanya. Do we have anybody on deck from the table? Just to get let them prepare. We have Emma. So Emma, you're on deck. So, Tanya asked all the candidates, York Southwestern has a history of flooding. What investment would your government make to fix this catastrophic flooding? The order of uh, the, the candidates, who we're going to go to uh, James, then Faisal, then Nadia, and then Tom. So, 
I myself have experienced flooding because of the poor urban planning that is taking place. We are intensifying our neighborhoods with li li leaving little green space available to handle the flood waters. We have to balance the proportion of property a developer is allowed to develop on versus green space that is not only needed for environmental reasons, but also for all of us so we don't end up with a giant flood in our backyards or our basements. This has been ignored by all the governments previously. They are taking money from big corporations and developers and they are developing 90%, 85% of the property and they are building monstrosities of high rises everywhere around us. So I would stop that, I would consult with the developers and have a smart urban development plan that is more proportioned to our community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I, I missed your name, but uh, sorry for uh, forgetting your name. But um, yes, flooding, it hits in our community. When it rains, it hits our community higher. I know that uh, our Rockcliffe neighborhood, also Liscombe, and many parts of our community. And as you member of provincial parliament, I've been fighting hard with Ford Conservatives to bring direct relief and support to those homes that are affected. And we have seen the decisions of Ford Conservatives supporting other communities, direct support when it came to um, uh, flooding issues. But in our community, they have not stepped up and supported. I have continued to make sure also as an NDP government, we will also invest in infrastructure. The infrastructure, the problem we found um, out when, um, when I was elected is that the there were many money that have been spent also on uh, infrastructure, especially in the case of Liscom in the neighborhood on up and Maple Leaf. There, they have the city invested money, the provincial invested money, but that money, um, when they did the, inf the infrastructure there, and then the rain came, and then the problem was the same. Well, the problem is the engineers, the city engineers, are not also doing their part. So, what we need also. To, to look into all those resources invested in flooding, to investigate and find out solutions <coughs> to fix this problem. Thank you. Thanks so much, Emma, uh, for the question. Uh, yes, there is a history of flooding in New York Southwest, and it comes down from the watershed. Uh, which begins in our green belt, comes through Black Creek into the Humber, and we need to have a government and a local representative that's actually going to ask for provincial money, not blame uh, federal and, and, and city counterparts for not providing it because they have somebody who can work with our federal partners and our municipal partners to bring that money to bear on flood mitigation in your southwest and once and for all. It has to involve expanding the bridges, uh, at Jane and Scarlet. It has to happen immediately, as well as planting more trees and so on uh, in Smythe Park and other areas. So it has to start with understanding the local issue, working with the community, building the relationships with other levels of government and with whoever happens to be the government, to be able to convince them that investments in this community are actually in good investments for all of Ontario. And that happens through relationship building, listening, and advocacy. That is what I will bring. Respectfully, we've had four years of representation that has not brought that to bear because there hasn't been provincial monies, despite what's being said at the table here tonight. I will act, I will be your voice, and I will do it with great pleasure. So the question makes me think of like when I uh, go walking with my daughter in Raymore Park and you see the, the signs about the, the, the massive uh, flood um, where that was, uh, 
Was it Hurricane Hazel, correct? Yes. So <clears throat> we learned from that, though. Once upon a time, all along Raymore Park, there were there were homes there, and so um, my apologies, but with what James had said, um, it's smart planning. You know, um, would be a very important thing. So the reason I brought that up is, look, once upon a time, we uh, we were building way down there where a hurricane came in and it wiped out an entire community, essentially. Many, many people died. Um, it, it's learning from what's going on. Um, that Humber watershed, absolutely. So um, planting more trees, um, taking care of that. And, and, and in certain ways, um, things have gone okay. Because if you, if you actually look at that watershed, apart from flooding, and, and the quality of the water and how polluted it is, it's actually less polluted now than it was 20 years ago. Um, so there have been improvements. Um, okay, yeah, thank you. So much. Uh, so, mental health and specifically in school. So, I can tell you personal experience. So, my daughter is on the uh, autism spectrum. She's uh, 10 years old. Amazing young lady. Um, it, it was hard for her. It, it, it's it, it's getting better, but it, this this whole pandemic has been really, really, really tough. Um, how do we make improvements? Well, we make smarter decisions. So. You're going to see a, a, a rise in mental health problems, especially the ones that were really little, about a year to two, three years old during this pandemic and having grown. They are so delayed verbally. If you look at the experts and, and they actually read what they say, these children were super delayed. And, and as far as all the mandates and everything are concerned, um, we believe mental health will improve if you get rid of these mandates. Like, look at the amount of overdose deaths there, there have been across Canada, right, during the pandemic, the amount of mental health issues among students, and never mind the adults. Um, so I truly believe getting rid of that nonsense, going back as much as we can to the way we all were used to living, as humans with our own choices, without forced medical interventions will do a lot for our mental health and our children's mental health. Thank you. Thanks so much for the question. I served on the front lines of education during this pandemic and I saw the impact on students in your Southwest and on their families as well as on my colleagues uh, it is imperative that we bring in a government that wants to invest in education. It starts by taking that uh, 413 highway and using the $10 billion that we build it and investing it in education, uh, in infrastructure, dropping class sizes to 20, hiring 10,000 more teachers, another 1,000 more mental health workers, ending wait times because suddenly we have people to actually do the work. Uh, it is imperative that we do this. The other thing that needs to happen immediately is to end mandatory online learning. We've seen that it doesn't work. It hurts our students. I sit on the other side of the screen and I see them just kind of dither off and not be able to pay attention because what they need is social interaction. They need caring adults. And we have so much work to do to bridge those gaps, and it's not gonna happen with a foreign government, and the only way to stop them is to bring in a government that understands this, and in me you have one of the most experienced voices on education that's running for any party across this province, and know that I will work diligently to ensure that these changes are made. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Julie, for your question. And I think uh, mental health is healthcare. We've seen it during the pandemic the last two years, the impact it had in our families. And each and every one of us knows someone experiencing a mental health. Um, we need, that's why the neo Democrats are actually including OHIP, you know, OHIP including, expanding OHIP to include the services and care and therapy into including OHIP. The Liberals sponsor that, and it's very important that our healthcare is not only, it is from head to toe, and mental health is also a component to that. We will also make sure that uh, in schools and young children, we will increase mental health support and special education uh, funding for that. Of course, our young people uh, will reduce also class sizes and ensure that each um, um, early uh, full uh, daycare you know, uh, classes and teachers and EAs are also included. We will also hire 20,000 teachers and also education workers. We will also repeal P124, which also needs to be rebuilt immediately uh, because that is not the way to treat frontline workers, heroes, and champions. And the Premier, you've heard many occasions, saying that they are frontline and heroes, but he turns around and introduces bills like this. We're going to um, uh, immediately repeal. Thank you. So as an independent, I get to cherry pick the best of the best ideas. And Basil, I would agree with including mental health services under OHIP as a brilliant idea. Furthermore, when we're talking about education, we, we need to allow the parents to access these mental health services as well. Because a healthy home equals a healthy child. We also need to increase our, um, or reduce our class sizes. However, I don't think the current government realizes what an average teacher's salary is. The average teacher's salary is $550 per contract working day. I'm not sure it's necessarily in our budget to reach those targets, but what I would propose is to offer TAs in each class, reducing the burden on the teachers, and they would act as a quarterback because we can't afford on an average salary of $101,000 per elementary school, according to the Sunshine List, to have that increase in hiring. I'm saying we hire some teachers, but we also hire some support staff to assist the teachers. There is a balance between the realities of each child's economic tax revenue for education and what we have to invest in education. And yes, scrap the fancy highway up there that wastes everybody's time, but thank you. Do we have somebody on deck? Do we have Bedbar, Yusuf, and Heather? Are they still here? You can read my question. Anybody has uh, any questions they want to ask, put up your hand and we'll have a volunteer to give you a form if you don't have one. Or if you filled out your form, put your hand up with the form and we'll come pick it up for you, okay? And thank you, Heather, for the question. Will you restore mandate protection of all, indecent, uh, all endangered species habitat, cancel broad Endangered Species Act exemptions, and scrap plans to let developers pay to slay, pay to fund, instead of taking measures to protect species. The order of the questions will be uh, Nadia, Tom, James, and then Faisal. Thank you, Heather. Hi, Heather, thanks so much for the question. So, you know, zooming out here, I can see there's a, there's an urgent need in Ontario to have a government that actually values uh, anything that's our natural environment, and currently we don't. Because if they did, they wouldn't have used 100 municipal zoning orders to literally pave through paradise and you know, put to, to uh, endangerment so many habitats and species in Ontario. Our Ontario Liberal Plan is one that will expand the Greenbelt, will build five new provincial parks 
build eight billion new trees in eight years, eight, excuse me, not billion, eight million new trees in eight years, and so on. The protection of our space is very important, which means that any developments that are going to happen that could slay our natural and green spaces and um, the species that live within them would have to happen with consultation. It would have to happen through transparent processes, subject to judicial review. And that's something that doesn't exist currently. Because there's so many people in this community that I've seen stand up for our natural environment and our wildlife. And they, you know, it, that consultation hasn't been meaningful up until now from what I've seen, particularly around the Edmonton Cross Down West Extension. So we will work with that, and I will be listening and advocating with my whole heart for our green space in this community. Thank you so much. the question and I'm honestly going to treat that as one of those where um, like I said with my experience as a student advisor if, if there's I, I don't know the exact details as far as our, our party's platform with that so I, I don't want to just make something uh, up as uh, how we would uh, want to treat small species um, but what I will reiterate is so say with our plan to get rid of the windmills sometimes there's been a little bit too much virtue signaling going on in, in a lot of different areas. So when you actually look at those windmills and what the liberals will purport and now the conservatives and the NDP are definitely on board is this is the best thing ever for the environment. However, look at the amount of concrete that goes into those things. Look at how long they last. Look at the rare earth minerals that are are, are, have to be mined to create those things and tell me where they go after their 20 years if they last that long and if that's great for our environment. Um, but as far as specifics with the small species, again, um, whoever asked the question, my apologies, I, I didn't jot it down. Uh, I'd be happy if you emailed me to find out the exact uh, stance from, from our party. Thank you. So in short, I would definitely protect all endangered species, period, end of story. But more importantly, many of the candidates talk about outside of our community, provincial parks. Obviously that's great, but we need to focus on our actual urban development and the intensification in which it's happening. And for instance, all the three parties, conservative, NDP, liberals, are moving towards restricting exclusion zones. This means that single family homes can now be torn down and multi-use buildings put on. It is removing the protections of our community to intensify regular neighborhoods and further develop land past our restriction areas. So instead of having like a 60% coverage or 50% coverage, we are now seeing 80. 90% coverages. And these in itself damage our own personal environment. And I want to stop that and be rational about how we develop our communities and the actual coverage of development. Thank you. Thank you, Heather, to, to your questions. Very good question and very important question. Uh, you know, the, the record of the Conservatives and the Liberals when it comes to environment is, is horrible. But my answer to your question is yes, yes, yes. And we'll also add to that also, we'll also consult with the community, make sure that the species, the environment is there and we protect it because that is part of who we are. Thank you. Question. For over a decade, York Southwestern has been fighting to bury the Eglinton LRT underground through our community. The current Metrolinx proposal invites an elevated bridge through our precious green belt, which will undoubtedly damage the environment. Will you support tunneling the Eglinton LRT through the Eglinton Flats? We'll go with that. Thank you. By 
Russell, then James, Tom, and then Nadia. Good. That's a good question. Um, as your member for the of Poland and as the candidate for the uh, NDP uh, running for re-election, yes, um, the community and the consultation previously, our uh, community was told that in 2016 it's going to be under ground and under towel. But then uh, with Metrolink, that has been become the tool of the days the government has really has not been very transparent. And we know that how the community has been treated. And I have been in the front and center fighting for the community, as you know, holding the government accountable. And definitely, yes, we need to make sure that we will protect Eglinton Flats and local green spaces. And uh, Eglinton Crosstowns has been also projected, but the ripples have, have started. And we have seen uh, the problems, the promises they've made, with also with, with the questions of the clean trains and electrification times and for Goa. And that record, as you all know about it, we will also make sure that also when it comes to transit so that we partner with the city, that we are going to institute um, about 50% funding for transit operating uh, cost and also implement a 10 minute service guarantee on our community members who rely on Kiro, on Kiro, on Jane, and Western and Lawrence. And those also we're going to make it implement 10 minutes of service guaranteed on those routes in our community. Thank you. Yes, I, I definitely believe that they, they should tunnel underneath um, the, the Eglinton Flats. I, I, from the time of being a little kid, I, I remember playing there and everything. That should, it's such a huge, important hub of the community to be able to have that, that space for, for, when we talked about mental health before too, um, to be able to go and exercise and do that stuff. It, it's imperative that that, that that stays around. Um, yeah, I, I, I remember being a little kid and along the golf course looking for for balls and along the Humber River as well. You, you want to maintain that. It, the, the flats are, are very important and 100%. And, and it just makes me, the, the, the conservative um, candidate's not here, but it makes me think a little further west, but in, in the Etobicoke Center writing, you see what, ha what had happened where along Eglinton for years and years there was no development, and then the Fords get into municipal back then, politics, and all of a sudden all this stuff is getting built up. It, it's absolutely ridiculous. So with the Eglinton Flats, 100%. It should be tunneled underneath, and that should be kept for the community. Absolutely, I will be happy to advocate for burying that line. It, we do not need a 1.5 kilometer bridge that goes through Pier and Park and the Edmonton Flats. If we, they can build the, uh, the channel between England and France, we can bury this line. So I will be happy to advocate for it. And let's be clear, <laughs> let's be clear. Let's be clear. Uh, meaningful dialogue has not been happening with this community. 
as your MPP, I would have and I will make sure that those meetings are happening and that our voices are being heard there and that we have a government that's ensuring that that is under judicial review, as I've mentioned before, that those dialogues have to happen the same way and equitably across this city and this province. Um, the other thing I will say is that um, it's imperative, it's imperative that we continue to push for this, no matter how far this project is along Metrolinx's agenda right now. Because if the community hasn't been consulted properly, then we're not gonna get the outcomes we need to do. We've seen in the past, and this is what I said at the meeting at the Eglin Cross Town West Extension, uh, in front of Metrolinx, I said when we have an active community here, which we do, and we have good provincial representation, and Metrolinx as partners, we can get things done, like we did with Mount Dennis Station, raising the bridge uh, over uh, Black Creek rather than cutting it through. We've seen this before, this is the precedent, let's make it happen again. Thank you so much. Judith asks, the highest number of deaths during the pandemic occurred in long-term care homes, particularly in the privately run homes. What would your party do about increased inspections, staffing levels, and careful scrutiny before licenses are rewarded or renewed? The order is uh, Nadia, then Tom, James, this is a sad, sad reality that we have uh, seen uh, light shed on during this pandemic. Uh, people ask me at the door all the time, Nadia, what would you do if you were there right now? What would you do? And I said, make sure the inspections are happening at a time when no one knows when they're coming and bring back uh, class action lawsuits in this province. <clears throat> The Ontario Liberals will end for-profit long-term care because nobody should be making a profit on the backs of people who have built this province. Uh, we will do that. We will ensure that we're investing uh, sufficient money so that people can age at home with dignity in their homes, that their caregivers um, and the frontline workers, the PSWs, uh, who are doing God's work, I know because I help to care for two aging loved ones throughout this pandemic at home. Um, with my dear friend Lucy. And ultimately, we will ensure that they're being paid a minimum of $25 an hour, and we're retaining the talent that we have in that sector. So I will be a champion on that because I've seen it firsthand. We lost two family members during the pandemic in long-term care, and it's not something we can allow to happen ever, ever again. Thank you. Thank you very, very much uh, for that question. Um, I'll preface it with this. So uh, what happened in, in long-term care was just um, insane during the, the pandemic. So um, my mom actually, she lives in long-term care. Um, she's in a private home, but I don't know if they're for-profit, but they, they run it quite well. Um, uh, they're of Polish descent. And it's down on Roncesville's. They want it to be in, in, in a home that's, uh, you know, where, where, where their background is taken into consideration, their dietary needs and whatnot. Um, but they got decimated. The, the, that home got absolutely decimated. My mom got COVID, actually had uh, pneumonia as well. But thank God, you know, she, she pulled through. She, she's doing fantastic. Uh, I'll, I'll give you some anecdotes about what she said, though. Um, she said that they lost a lot of the workers that she really, really loved in, in that home. Um, why did they lose them? Over the mandates. Um, so a lot of these seniors lost people that they were connected to over those mandates. Um, and I'll bring up in that same home, in, in uh, October of 2019, my, my, my father was in that same home. Um, he passed out right before the pandemic. Um, what we had said as a family is, thank God it happened in October of 2019, rather than four or five months later, because we got to celebrate with 200 people and celebrate his life. Whereas I lost a friend, and never forget this, everyone, if you had this happen to you too. I lost a friend on April 30th, 
eight of us were allowed to be at the funeral. What did that do to the family? What did that do to all families? Thank you. I think the whole panel can agree that what happened over the pandemic and on care, care moments was not me. Horrific. Um, I have never seen that in my lifetime or anything similar to that in my lifetime. Um, speaking for our seniors, I think we need to advocate to keep them in homes uh, with their families. And we need to have the support network within the LIN. This, this includes more and easier education for nurses so they can quickly get up to speed at the levels in which they need to be. So there's various treatments within senior care and we don't need to have all of the education maybe necessary for all the clients. Second of all, we need to separate if you are able to take care of a family member, we need to separate what is income for them versus family assets versus their assets. There is a difference. And the way the current government allocates resources based on those assets is unfair and hurtful to those that have planned and saved all their life to retire and have been responsible with their finances. And I think that we really need to look as a community into keeping our loved ones with family. Thank you. What we have seen um, what uh, the military have revealed, and we knew this before the military have revealed what was happening. We have been uh, Fighting this in 2017, um, the, uh, the liberals, uh, the Duca uh, and, and the liberals, voted against an NDP motion for full time, long term inquiry to look into in 2017, well before the pandemic we've seen. And that was in September of 14, 2017. They failed to increase daily standards, of course, uh, and care. What we will do as an NDP government, first and foremost, to will expand public not-for-profit long-term care. So more money goes into care instead of corporate back accounts. There's no money to make money from the banks of our seniors. Our seniors have contributed so much and it is not a, a dividend. We will end that profit maximization in the banks of our seniors. We'll improve home care so people can stay in their own homes longer and immediately implement four hours of care per person per day. And also make sure that staff, residents, and clients have also the tools and the resources they need, including PPEs they need. We will also rebuild Bill 124 and ensure enough BSWs and nurses uh, to provide quality care. Thank you. Thank you, Judith. The next question is from uh, Rick, and it, uh, it's about uh, net zero. Do you support provincial, local citizens funding for building retrofits, community renewal energy conversions, electric vehicles to get to net zero. The order will be uh, down the table from uh, James, Nadine, Nadia, sorry, Faisal, and then Tom. So, I support net zero. However, how we get there, I do not support. The Liberal government has decided to use the cane and tax us through the wazoo for this environmental effort. And tax dollars do not equal environmental change. As far as I know, the electric cars are 
mainly as environmentally damaging as gas excavation at this time. There is something that the Ford government is perpetuating about green steel. And this is like your street hustler telling you it's organic heroin. It doesn't exist. And I think when we look at how we move forward, we need to start to make small changes and not penalize the regular people. When you look at electric cars, Tesla, beautiful car, $100,000. The liberals will give you a $9,000 rebate if they are elected. I don't have $100,000, so that $9,000 doesn't matter to me. So I think, yes, we need to get to net zero, but we need to do it in a logical way that doesn't hurt regular people within our community. Thank you. Thanks so much for the question. Uh, respectfully, James, I will say that it was the Ontario Liberals who actually ended any kind of coal power in Ontario, built the Green Belt, uh, and it started with the investments in electronic vehicles and building out the infrastructure for those, which the Ford government promptly, upon taking office, scrapped. Okay, so let's be clear on the record. Second of all, second of all yes, 100% towards that zero, zero. You're speaking to a geographer and environmental studies teacher for the past 20 years. Cut greenhouse gas emissions by 50%, um, below 2005 levels by 2030. We didn't have to have that carbon tax you're talking about because we had a cap and trade system here in Ontario that was top in the world with three other uh, regions in all of North America. We were making money in Ontario. We were leading on electronic vehicles. The rebate is just what we'll begin with to reinstate. And we should be actually designing and piloting those kind of electronic vehicles here in Ontario. Why aren't we the innovators? Why aren't we creating those jobs, those sustainable jobs, and making my students and your children the captains of those industries? That's how we keep Ontario as a leader. That's how we do it in a way that brings us to net zero and makes us uh, global leaders in sustainability. So thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you, Rick, uh, to the question. But the Liberal record is completely different. They saw Hydro One. You see, they planned to build unnecessary new highways of a green space and farmlands, failed to electrify, up express and go net. That's your record. Um, and, 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 and we will, uh, I, I will say yes, and we will uh, plan to reach net zero emissions and for, for all mm. new um, uh, buildings as well. And also uh, electric cars will also restore also another important for the environment here is we will restore environmental commission and expand the grand green belt and that's also a very good thing thank you i believe the environment is very important but i also believe that uh net zero is um, one of those catchphrases that's uh like the, the elusive uh, rainbow unicorn. Um, it's, it's lovely to talk about, but let's look at what's really going on. So look at how many people are in Ontario compared to the global population. Look at what's happened since the time that we've started doing all the windmills in Ontario, what happened to our hydro rates, and then go look at China and how many coal plants they built. So that doesn't help the world environment. It still affects us as well. So it's lovely to talk about net zero, but take a look at the people that talk about it on the news. So you'll get a guy like Justin Trudeau that wants to talk about that too. Look at how much he flies around in a jet. Look at the amount. And then it's, oh, we're gonna plant some trees and we're gonna do some carbon offsets. So I do think the environment is incredibly important, but you have to take a look at what the priorities are right now. We're having trouble being able to pay rent and get food and then gas. And then we're being told, oh yeah, yeah, buy this 100,000, as you said, $100,000 electric car. Yeah, we can all do that. How many can afford that? How many have electric cars in here? But how many of us have had our hydro rates skyrocket and food skyrocket? Exactly, thank you. The next question is about the, the housing market. Will the candidate in 
ensure that we continue that we can continue to live here by following all of the recommendations in the housing task force. What we'll do is uh, we'll go we'll reverse up uh, the table, okay? And then uh, we'll start with uh, Tom and then with James. Can you repeat one more time, please? Sure. So about the housing crisis, will the candidates ensure that we can continue to live here by following all the recommendations in the housing task force? Okay, so I'll be, uh, I would love to be able to look up all the exact recommendations. My apologies that I, I, I don't know them all. Um, but as far as just housing affordability, um, it's, it, it's, it's, it, it's, rents are getting insane. Everything's getting insane. It's just, it's so hard to, to live, period, in this province, in this country now. Um, I believe if people have more money in their pockets in general, it will help them be able to afford the housing. So going back to the questions when it was about food security or with the gentleman with the disability question, it's going back to that and the more money is in your pocket. So cutting HST, cutting the carbon taxes, getting rid of these windmills, they'll all put more money in your pocket so you'll be able to afford the housing. And, and again, I'll go back into my apologies that off the top of my head, I don't know all the recommendations of the task force, but um, I'll be happy to, to look into that. Thank you. That's a very good question because housing is unaffordable. And we've seen it, and because of the neglect, not only the last four years, but the last 15 years. We need a, a, a bold and concrete solution to this issue. We, we are going to build 1.5 homes over the next 10 years, making it easier to buy a home and strengthen home buyers' protections. And exclusionary zoning and increase options available for purchase and rental. But we are going to also put 10% equity down payments to allow, if you want to buy a home, and if you're able to get a, 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 get a mortgage, that 10% down payments could be an equity loan to you so that more people can afford the risk of their own. Restore real rent control and end the evictions. Increase also more co-ops and non-market rental housing stocks as well. Increase accessible housing and options for persons with disabilities. And we are going also to provide direct uh, rent subsidies to people because we need to tackle part of the affordability, it's part of the housing, a cost of living, and we need to make sure also we go after speculators and Filipinos. And, and thank you. Thanks so much for the question. This is, besides affordability, housing, I, I wrap right in there as the next most um, discussed issue that I hear of at doors. And it's nice to see five more that the NDP has finally come to the party, although be it late, on these housing recommendations. Because you're in, in your initial platform, it wasn't until the third version that came out that you mentioned 1.5 uh, million new homes, including affordable ones. Uh, we brought in rent controls. The Ford government got rid of them. We would be bringing them back. Give cities incentives to approve housing faster and exclusionary zoning. Um, and build an actual Ontario Home Building Corporation to be able to build those quicker. Housing is on our agenda. It was there in the former um, Liberal government under the Fair Housing Act that also dealt with supportive housing. So for people that were at risk of homelessness, dealing with mental health and addiction issues, to have the suite of services they would need to be able to maintain uh, living in their homes. This is all part of how we would approach this. And it's important to note that out of those 55 recommendations that came out of that report, Mr. Ford, and his strategy doesn't mention the word affordable housing once. Okay, so he's going to build them up by the new 413 highway in the Green Belt, and it's not going to be ones that our children or our seniors or anybody in our community is going to be benefiting from. We need to bring them here in York Southwestern. We have a federal minister of housing for the first time who needs a provincial partner, and that's me. I hope you'll choose me on June 2nd.
This is a very interesting topic. Um, first of all, the, both parties propose to build more homes. However, we have a shortage of labor, and labor prices are going up. So I don't understand how we're going to be able to balance that without addressing and incentivizing our young children to join trades and quickly move them through the trades, which we have to address first. Second of all, when they say rent control, they mean today's prices. What I propose is a fix per square foot adjustment to housing across the GTA and in our area. Right now, housing is not affordable. They're going to put rent controls at unaffordable levels and continue down that road. The third thing that I would suggest is to actually have an Ontario Mortgage Corporation for profit that goes back into the Ontario government, which removes our dependency on human capital and taxation and diversifies our portfolio. It helps reduce our bond and debt lending costs. And furthermore, we are able to tailor mortgages in different ways to meet our community needs. This would be a comprehensive solution that addresses many issues that the government fails to consider. Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna to stick to the topic of uh, finances and uh, ask the question, what is your position on the guaranteed annual income? And uh, the order will be uh, Nadia, Tom, Faisal, and then James. I support universal basic income. Ontario Liberals will bring back the demonstration project because we believe in data. <laughs> and the best way to know how it's affecting people's lives is to actually have people use it and tell us how it works and what needs to change. So I was one of the first candidates to support um, universal, universal basic income. As I told you, I spoke at the march. It was my pleasure to do so. I want to see people empowered uh, and living their best lives because that's what's going to make Ontario the best that we can be in leaders in this world. So you can count on me to push for that. Thank you. So as far as universal basic income or guarantee and guaranteed annual income, I, I believe it's a it's lovely in theory, um, but how much will it cost? And furthermore, I believe what makes people the most proud, the most prosperous, is actually working. So it's, it's not saying, oh, they're lazy people don't want to work, nothing like that. But being able to help and support people, um, unless it's, it's cases of disability or something like along those lines, okay? But in general, when people feel the best is when they're productive, they're going to work. So if you're just going to give everyone a universal basic income. I'm sorry, I have trepidation about that because I think it could take away incentive. It can take away when people are working together, why am I gonna work harder than him if it doesn't matter anyway? Or why am I even gonna, if you saw during the CERB time, I mean, it was vitally important with what happened, I get it. But look at how many employers, in retail especially, couldn't find workers. They couldn't find workers because a lot of the workers that would have fulfilled those roles were actually getting the money from the government and they'd rather stay home. And that's not just the generalization, that was happening. So it's supporting people to want to work, to want to be productive is what I think would be best for the economy. Thank you. Thank you to the question, and I do support it, uh, universal basic income. I also have uh, a supporter for the, um, the, the team that is universal basic team uh, advocating. And I think that's very important because most of our uh, members of our community are living in uh, horrible conditions. Of course, they cannot, uh, we've seen also people are really struggling. And a nation like us, Canada and Ontario, we can do it. And definitely an NDP government will implement it. Thank you. Absolutely, we need it. It's a matter of dignity for people. And it 
also helps to perpetuate a better environment amongst our community because people are less likely to commit petty theft. They're able to have proper nutrition and some fundamental cleaning products and some just basic life needs. But we also need to support them in finding their career path and journey. We also need to allow for those that did not graduate high school to be able to try their hand in college and university at any stage in their life without barrier. Carleton University has an excellent program that has been proven where anybody can register and try regardless of their academic experience. We need to bring in those types of policies. We also need to look at the realities of funding these programs. And yes, it is a reality. And that's where stuff like having a mortgage corporation run by our government, having an insurance corporation run by our government, certain services will bring in revenue that taxpayers do not need to pay for these types of programs. Everyone talks about the healthcare system failing. Why aren't we talking about rehiring the nurses? I want to hear the point of view on uh, on this very particular topic, and uh, we're going to go with uh, Faisal, James, Tom, and then uh, Nadia. Nadia. Thank you. That is a very important question. Our healthcare is who we are. And definitely, yes, first and foremost, we have to rebuild Bill 124 and implement a strategy to recruit, retain, and retain work, uh, uh, workers, including nurses and doctors and PSWs. Increase also our hospital funding and adding also in the that um, um, program uh, mental health services, dental care and pharma care, to also mental health also care to include all oh, seven thousand dollars each year. And uh, as I said earlier, a healthcare is from head to toe. And shortening also wait times for surgeries and procedures. Dental care and mental mental health and pharma care will plan will ease pressure also on household budgets. And if you look at it, um, um, our healthcare and hiring it is essential that we have to hire more. You know, healthcare workers, because we have seen during the pandemic uh, the, the challenges we have in our healthcare, and we need to also um, hire more and also put more resources into our healthcare. It's essential that we do that. Also, we have to pay well those we call them frontline heroes and champions. Thank you. So my colleagues up here refer to the pandemic as being over. For frontline workers, it is not over. They are still facing backlogs in emergency rooms, and we need to address this, again, through education and streamlining and getting more nurses hired and different positions and qualifications for those nurses to be able to um, fulfill those roles in different capacities. We also have to answer the question, which is why we are not rehiring them. And quite frankly, it's because of the civil litigation against the Liberal Party. Because if we rehire them, they have grounds to say that the vaccines that they were forced to get as a decision was, um, was forced upon them, and now they're not necessary and we're rehiring them. So this is a legal issue that is preventing us from hiring some of those nurses back. Furthermore, I'd like to draw attention to the fact that the Liberal Party removed their civil right to litigate against pharma companies when it came to vaccines. Now, I don't care if you're for vaccines or against vaccines, 
our rights to litigate should never be removed. We should never be removed from our legal system. And that was all the Liberals. On the point of order before I answer the question, let's be clear, you're referring to the federal Liberal government? Is that what you mean? Because our Ontario government is conservative and it's a Doug Ford government. Is that, are, are you referring to the federal government? The, the federal government. Okay, right. federal government. So you guys have a 100%. We're two different parties. Wait, 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 wait. You guys have different thoughts? <laughs> it's very clear. They're two different parties. That's like talking about an electrician, since we're on the housing file, and, and a bricklayer, and, and explain, blaming the bricklayer for something that the electrician did or didn't do. The bricklayer doesn't call themselves an electrician. They both build houses, but yeah. Anyway, just to be clear, our government that we're talking about here in Ontario is a conservative one. So, thank you. Um, I was going to say, around nurses, my sister's a nurse. Oh, oh sorry, I thought it was my turn. You want to just go ahead? Sorry, sorry, I thought it was That's my okay. turn. That's okay, you started it on the last one. Sorry about that. That's okay. Sorry, but I thought we were going this way. Sorry, I thought it was my turn. Um, my sister's a nurse, my cousin's a nurse, my family is filled with teachers and nurses, and I talk to them pretty much every day on the front line on their way back uh, working during the pandemic and both of them would tell me daily that they were one bad conversation away from pretty much pulling the chute uh, in their words, leaving this province, selling their homes and, and just not, being, not doing the job anymore. I heard the same thing from so many of our neighbours here in North Southwest as I knocked on their door. So the first thing Ontario Liberals will do is repeal um, Regulation 124 that caps nurses at 1% pay, uh, hires 100,000 new nurses, but we have to support them in their, uh, in their actual training. Uh, we want to gain them, train them, uh, appreciate them, and retain them. And a lot of women are doing this job. It's not only women, but this is a largely a women-dominated profession. And so we have to support them in other ways too, because when they come home from work, they have families that depend on them. And so ensuring that we are giving families the rebate on childcare and expanding childcare now that it's available in Ontario in such a way that it can support these women is also really important. So thank you for that. One hundred percent, we would rehire all the nurses that were fired due to the mandates. So it was lovely to, for all of us to cheer and everyone to stand in Queen's Park and say, "Oh, there are heroes! There are heroes!" But then, as soon as they weren't willing to listen to being mandated to take medical intervention that never happened before, they were fired. They were thrown to the street. And it's not just the nurses, but that's something that. Uh, can be done right away. It is disgusting how they were treated. And, and like I said with, with my mom at the nursing home, it wasn't just the nurses. A lot of PSWs lost their jobs. So it's fantastic that we want to hire new people to do these roles and we do need new people. But what about those people, sometimes with decades of experience in nursing, that lost their jobs over this? It is absolutely ridiculous. And New Blue actually has two, at least two nurses that are in that exact boat. So they are running as to, for member of provincial parliament because they never would have thought about getting into politics, but they got fired over this stuff. So now they're, they're, they're working hard and I, I hope they get elected, but they're a great voice. So it is disgusting what we did with those healthcare workers, what we did with lots of different workers. So yes, we would absolutely rehire them. I appreciate everybody's uh, questions tonight. Um, it's uh, at it's 8.42. What we're going to do is uh, we need to be out of here by uh, 9, so we're going to have uh, two minutes for uh, closing uh, remarks, and um, then um, we're going we're gonna to ask the candidates to uh, step outside, and then, then they, you can ask them all the questions, uh, all the questions you want. Or what we're going to do is we're going to have uh, uh, James go first, then Faisal, then uh, Nadia, and then Tom. Two minutes. Closing remarks. Thank you, everybody, for coming and attending tonight. I hope that 
you will consider an independent candidate. An independent candidate can advocate for the needs without party restrictions. Each party, political party, has a party whip. And you have to abide by the party's agenda. And sometimes this inhibits the ability for individual candidates with good intentions to truly represent the community. As an independent, I would have no barriers. I would have equal speaking time. And I would be willing and able to work with whatever party has an idea that suits the community that we live in. It is a different thought, like Uber, like Airbnb, but it is the new way of doing things. It is time for public service to come back and self-service to move away. Thank you. I would like to thank everyone uh, for taking the time out to join us uh, here tonight. And a special thanks to the organizations that put this forum together. Uh, New Democrats have a strong, proud history of standing up for your Southwestern. Not just uh, your elected officials, but also as your neighbors, I'm proud that I have been able to continue legacy on both counts, whether it is a fighting for clean trains, speaking out against a scorch of gun violence, pushing for vaccine fairness and testing equity, or pushing for community benefits on infrastructure projects like the Crosstown. Uh, uh, cross New Democrats have stood shoulder to shoulder with fellow citizens to ensure our voices were heard and our interests were represented. But, but here is the problem. Over the last 19 years, York South Boston has constantly had to fight Queen's Park just to be heard, and that shouldn't be. We deserve a government that sees us as a valuable partner, not an obstacle to overcome. We know that we cannot count on Michael Ford to stand up to die, his uncle. And we cannot count on Stephen Balduca to fix the mess he helped create, or even win his seat. This June, you have the opportunity to re-elect someone you can count on to always put your Southwestern first, and to elect a government that prioritizes the things that matter most to you. you are, we are focused on making life more affordable, and also on protecting and strengthening the services you and your family depend on. Healthcare, schools, childcare, as a COVID strategic reversal. Well, thank you, and I'm asking your vote tonight as your neighbor, and we need a, a strong voice, strong local voice for, for strong, ready to work for you. Vote for me, Faisal Hassan. Thank you. Thanks everybody for the amazing questions tonight and the opportunity to actually speak with you this evening. Uh, what we've seen is clear. This government has failed us. They failed us when it comes to education, they failed us when it comes to protecting our seniors, and they failed to protect our natural environment and preserve our valuable green spaces in this community. It's clear that Doug Ford does not see the connection between investing in people and economic dignity, and this is a problem that needs to stop. We need a government that believes in people and communities, and the Ford Conservatives do not. Uh, this is why they make cuts, neglect seniors, and our small businesses. They don't see the connection between these things and building a globally competitive economy. That's why making the right choice this election is vital for our future. Two years into the, new pan into the pandemic and 22 years into a new millennium, uh, this is our moment to decide what matters, to be visionary, and to be aspirational. We need a government that knows that it's their job to invest in people and public systems. One that will build an education system that treats our children as our brain trust. And one that will build a health care, home care, and long-term care system that helps our elders to age with dignity. A government that values our green space and moves forward sustainably. We all know that from the past four years that Doug Ford's Conservatives are not this government, and uh, they will not get this done. 
And the NDP did not hold them to account and will not prevent them from forming another conservative majority. Only the Ontario Liberals can stop forward. I believe in your Southwestern. That's why I'm asking you to choose an Ontario Liberal government that will make life more affordable and invest in us. So, the choice is up to you, but if you vote for me, help is on the way, you will stop two fours with one vote, and together we will build the province that we deserve. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, committee the, that put this sort of all the different organizations, so Mount Dennis Community Association, Western Village Resident Association, and the Rockcliffe Smith Smythe Community Association for letting me to, finding out about the debate today and then letting me in. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate that. Um, and thank you to all of you for, for showing up, whichever way you vote. It's amazing that you're coming in here supporting democracy and, and, and kudos to you. Um, when, when Nadia and uh, James were talking before about, uh, I agree with you 100% on, on, on uh, the, the parties not being, because we consider ourselves, the uh, conservatives, as a provincial arm of the federal liberal. So I agree with you 100% just because federal and liberal, you might have the same names. It doesn't mean that, uh, that you're the exact same. So essentially, we believe that the conservatives like the Liberals before them, have been greatly overspending, greatly overspending. Uh, we want to put money back into people's pockets, again, cutting HST from 13% down to 10%, getting rid of the carbon tax, and getting rid of the windmills that have made our electricity market a banana republic type of market. Um, so, and if you've, if you've had any, if you're one of those that don't like the way things have necessarily gone the last couple of years. If you look and you say, hey, look at who's had the seat here for the last couple of decades, and look at who's been, who's formed provincial government over the last couple of decades, and if you're a little bit fed up and you don't really like those choices, please take a look at us. Please take a look, take a look at the website, take a look at the new blueprint. Thank you.